So the properties of underpinnings, um, they're generally made from linen or cotton. Um, linen earlier in the century, um, cotton as the cotton economy starts booming in the United States um, and becomes more accessible and cheaper. Linen is a wonderful fabric because it's durable, it's breathable, it's absorbent, it's easy to clean, and it grows softer with wear. Um, in fact, I just had a researcher at our collection center and we were admiring this linen shirt that was so soft, it literally felt like silk. It was just a joy to behold. Um, cotton has a lot of those same properties. Cotton is um, fairly durable. It is breathable. It's absorbent. It breathes, as my mom used to say. Um, but it did require more frequent washing to keep clean. And um, throughout most of the 19th century, undergarments were white or a kind of off-white color that was referred to as blonde. And this was so it could stand up to frequent washings in hot water. Um, remember also we're at a time when a lot of um, dyes are not color fast. So if you're going to throw something in a pot of boiling hot water and scrub it and scrub it and scrub it, um, anything other than an unbleached um, fabric is going to fade and just not hold up to the task. So um, white is actually the best choice for undergarments and for very small children, um, things that really need to be um, scrubbed vigorously and often. So I'm going to take you through, um, we're going to start with the 1860s because this is what we have on display in uh, the museum. It's kind of like a, it's a sort of like probably one of the more interesting um, decades in terms of underpinning because the 1860s is the era of the cage crinoline. And so um, what we're going to do is go through all the layers that were necessary to achieve this bell-shaped silhouette in the 1860s. So um, imagine that we are starting in our birthday suit, stark naked. We're going to go through each of the layers in order that they would be put on. So step one is the chemise. And the chemise is your basic foundational garment. It's kind of like a short sleeve nightgown, except for not quite as long. They usually hit about knee length or so. And this is made out of cotton or linen. And this is the one that's worn closest to the body to absorb dirt and sweat. It is your basic number one layer. Um, because it's getting um, pretty, you know, sweaty and kind of grimy fairly frequently, this is also the garment that women have um, multiple iterations of. I mean, think of it as sort of like a, the equivalent of a pair of panties today. You basically put on a fresh one every day because they're going to get kind of grimy um, at night. Um, so you um, keep your linens fresh. It absorbs all the dirt and oils. Um, this is also going to serve as a buffer between your skin and the later layers. And so what I'm going to show you next is um, irritating to myself and other fashion historians and other um, historical reenactors who know better. But every so often you'll see someone like this and just no, you know, this was not done. People did not just slap their corset onto their bare body like this. And this is a woman who is like, oh, I live like I'm in the 19th century and she's been on the Today Show and she has a blog and everything. And this woman should know better. Um, your corset would always, always, always go over a chemise. So next is drawers. Um, and drawers are kind of a new thing in the 19th century. Um, they get going in Regency England. They start to pop up in the early 19th century. By about the second quarter of the 19th century, you start to see them in America. And um, it's sort of like an urban um, middle and upper class fashion that sort of spreads out geographically and um, socioeconomically throughout the rest of the century. So if you're in the 1840s or 50s, um, drawers are kind of still optional. Um, there's not, you know, the, the chemise kind of does the job. There's not a like crying need for them because your chemise going down to your knees is still going to kind of cover up your, your business. Um, but drawers started to be used and um, they're called drawers because you draw them on. And uh, you'll notice that the center is split. Um, this is for uh, ease of using the restroom. Um, it would be very difficult to kind of hike your skirts up and hike your drawers down. And so these are the drawers that are on display in the museum. Um, and you can see there's a little uh, graphic over the top of the label back there. This was something I'd never seen before um, on any piece of historical clothing. Um, 
the drawers were marked in the waistband and that is not at all unusual. In fact, it's rather common. Um, it was a practice of marking laundry with your name and this is to keep track of it in the wash because if you can imagine a household where there is a you know mother and she has four daughters and everyone's washing their drawers and then after wash day, you've kind of got to sort everything out and get drawers back to the, you know, the proper person, um, writing your name in your underpants, just like you're going to camp is an efficient way to do that. Um, so what we have here is a pair of drawers that belong to a woman named Carolyn Sutherland. It's stamped with her mark C.A. Sutherland. Um, sadly, Carolyn died in childbirth and um, her drawers were apparently appropriated by her sister-in-law, Mary Hogue Sutherland, who crossed out the C.A. and wrote in the M.H. Um, again, I've never seen this before that someone else uh, has penciled in their own initials. And to our modern eyes, it kind of says like, oh my gosh, you know, she, she stole her dead sister-in-law's underwear. Um, I think it should reinforce to us just the amount of work that goes into this clothing. Um, I should mention that most undergarments are made by women for their own personal use. And even when women are hiring dressmakers, um, that's typically for their more elaborate garments that require a more precise fit. Their undergarments are things that are going to be handmade for their own use. So Carolyn Sutherland's sister-in-law probably saw a pair of drawers and thought like, well, that would save me 10 hours of my life. And, you know, just wrote in her initials and went from there. Next are the stockings. So stockings are long knitter sewn hosiery that reached above the knee. It's not to be confused with socks, which are shorter, like, you know, the socks we're familiar with today. And stockings could come in basically any variety. They could be um, knitted of extremely fine silk for special occasions. They could be kind of chunky, serviceable wool or cotton for every day. They did go above the knee, so um, it was common for women to use garters, like tie them above their legs with a piece of ribbon. I would imagine they probably still, you know, sag down, which would have driven me crazy. And they could be also um, embroidered nicely um, for decoration, or they could be kind of plain. Um, a lot of variety there. And stockings were being mass produced in England um, starting as early as I want to say the 18th century, certainly the early 19th century. And so it was possible to buy your stockings from a store. But again, a lot of women um, are going to be hand knitting their own stockings. Next is shoes asterisk because um, there are a couple schools of thought out there and probably you might have heard both. Um, some people say that uh, shoes went on before the corset because it was easier to put them on than after you got in the corset and your range of motion um, was uh, restricted a little bit. So I've definitely heard that argued. Um, there's also evidence in the form of this woman um, from around 1900 wearing a corset and bending down and touching her toes that corsets really aren't all that restricting. And a woman probably would have been able to put her shoes on just fine after the corset, especially if they're um, slippers or, you know, kind of slip ons. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll leave that up to debate. I'm not going to take a side here. I'll be Switzerland on that issue. But in our museum exhibit, we have them um, following the uh, stockings and preceding the corset. Which brings us to the corset. So the corset's main function is to provide a smooth foundation for garments. Um, number one. So I mentioned that a lot of the bodices fitted so closely um, that that smooth foundation underneath was essential to the look of the garment. And this is especially true um, in the 18 um, 70s and 80s were this really like tight fitting, um, they called it a basque or a bodice or a waist was kind of the look. And so, um, and it also like, it, it was, it's, it's measured specifically to your body. So your corset, your, your bodice would be sewn to you wearing your corset, weighing a certain amount, you know, having certain proportions that, um, that are not very forgiving. You know, if your weight changed considerably, um, you would have to basically alter your garments to accommodate it. So we're going to do a little interlude here because the corset is one of the most um, sort of controversial and, you know, it's sort of the iconic garment of the 19th century. And there's a lot of um, sort of myths surrounding it. And probably the biggest myth is that, you know, women tight laced, that this was a like torture device, horrendous thing. And women tried to get the 17 inch waist like Scarlett O'Hara and they were always 
fainting and you know they had their ribs removed and this is sort of not the case um there probably were young fashionable women who tight laced and lace their corsets tighter than they should um there are always people who take fashion to the extreme just like um you know the kardashians today are waist training and and doing things in the sake of fashion that you know probably um jane jane q public is not going to do for the vast majority of American women, a corset is essentially like a bra. It's a support garment. Um, and it serves um, the purpose of supporting back and breasts that really isn't offered by anything else they're wearing. And you also have to um, keep in mind that there are petticoats and skirts um, riding on the waist. And so the corset kind of helps to carry that weight and distribute weight more evenly. So there are you know, positives to the corset. Um, most women did not tight lace. Um, and the corset reduced women's waist by an average of two inches. And um, my uh, worker, <laughs> Elizabeth, said, that still sounds like a lot to me. And so, yes, it is, you know, we modern women are not um, used to having our figures constrained um, in a way. So it, it is more than we're used to today. It's not, you know, it's not like you're taking 10 inches off your waist. And a lot of the function of a corset is also to sort of change the shape of the torso from one that's like elliptical to slightly more rounded. So um, studies have been done. There was one um, published a few years ago by Rebecca Gibson of America University who studied uh, skeletal remains and her research indicated that um, corsets did not alter women's skeletons. So people, women are not doing long-term damage to their skeletons. Um, and if uh, Elizabeth, if you wanna throw in the article about corsets into the um, chat now. Um, I'll give you a reference that has some good corset background. Um, another article on live science um, indicated that the average corseted waist was 22 inches. Now this um, sounds super small to our modern ears because today the average waist size in America is somewhere between 32 to 35 inches. However, um, 50 years ago, the average waist size in America was 24 to 25 inches. So again, indicating that a corset um, isn't reducing an average waist by all that kind of much. Um, what is interesting to unpack are sort of the, you know, the ideals of beauty and who gets access to them and what does it mean when you don't have access? And there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so this ideal of femininity with a nipped in waist is one that's actually in direct opposition to another feminine ideal, which is that of motherhood. You know, a, a mother has sort of a, a rounded figure, a, um, a pregnant belly is a round belly. So having this um, kind of nipped in waist look is sort of um, idealizing a, you know, youthful non motherly figure. Um, it is something that is not um, practiced by all of society, um, so but it is aspirational. So because corsets are fairly inexpensive, they're fairly accessible to all. Um, you know, people can put them on and they can achieve this idealized shape. There some women who um, don't. Um, older women, for example, are sort of socially exempt from wearing corsets um, in advanced age. Um, it was common for many women to just kind of go without or to wear their corsets very loose. And so that's something kind of interesting to unpack. You know, what does that say about women in advancing age and um, their femininity um, and even their, their sexuality? Is that something that is sort of um, assumed to be foregone um, in advancing age? And then there are people um, who do not have access to corsets, um, enslaved women, um, women from um, immigrants from different ethnic backgrounds. And so there's, uh, there's judgment cast upon women who are not in corsets, um, the idea of a loose woman, a woman who's unbound, and it's sort of tied up with ideas of sexual promiscuity. And, um, you know, how, how fair is that? How fair is it to impose this ideal on women and then judge people who are unable to attain the idea? Deal, although that's sort of, um, you know, the story of women's lives throughout history. So moving on, um, I will stop. And I'm sorry, I, uh, I am not closely monitoring the chat because that would throw me off my game and I would lose my mojo altogether. But I'm going to stop and pose a question to you. Um, have you ever worn anything to shape your body? And how did it feel physically and emotionally? 
and I'll start off with a personal anecdote. Um, it's not quite shapewear, but I'm not a huge fan of pantyhose. And I remember I had my first job out of college was a brief um, stint at a corporate insurance office. And I was pulled aside by the manager one day and said, you know, like, you know, I could see you doing a good job here, but you really need to start wearing pantyhose. That's company policy. And until you start to do that, you're, you're not going anywhere in this company. And I remember feeling like, Ugh, I hate pantyhose. I find them so constricting. And B, like, why does my professional success hinge on pantyhose? I don't know. It rubbed me the wrong way. So if anyone else wants to chime in about um, any shaping undergarments that you might uh, might have worn or wear. Girdles, leggings, and leotards. Um, yeah, there's shapewear and Spanx are kind of the new uh, new figure. I don't like those either, but you know they're a necessity. I kind of have chosen that over like diet and exercise at this point. And some people are mentioning, yeah, um, how you know even basic things like bras and things are kind of feel constricting if we're. Uh, quarantining at home or COVID has kept us home when we're used to being very relaxed and putting on, you know, basic foundational garments are kind of feeling constricting. And I see a lot of reenactors who are saying they, um, they wear corsets and they love them. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to just keep moving along because I have a tendency to go on and on and go over my time. Um, so I want to try not to do that this time. Um, let's see. Okay, so the under petticoat, and keep in mind we're in the 1860s, so we're working up to the cage crinoline here. And then under petticoat has a couple of different functions. Um, one, it keeps things covered because hoops had a tendency to tip up. Um, and two, um, they were often quilted or flannel in the winter, so they also kept you nice and toasty warm. And next is the hoop. So these extend skirts without having to wear a lot of layers of petticoats. Um, they are generally not worn while working. So um, if you are a domestic servant on the job, if you're working in a factory, Probably, if you're working around the house, you're probably not going to be in hoops, although this isn't like a hard and fast rule. Um, there are um, cartoons of the era that show domestic servants in hoops and they're, um, they're kind of classist cartoons. So, you know, it's the employers making fun of their um, servants kind of trying to dress above their station. And there are um, stories of women who are working in factories and whose um, crinoline extended skirts have gotten caught in machinery um, to very harmful effect. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally if you're just hanging out around the house scrubbing the floors, you're probably not going to put on a hoop. This is for like getting dressed to see people essentially. We're gonna do a little bit of an interlude here, hoop pros and cons. Um, pro, the hoop kind of looks like it's awkward and unwieldy, but in reality, it was the opposite because um, that bell-shaped silhouette did not start with the hoop skirt. The bell-shaped silhouette gave rise to the hoop skirt. Um, before having a hoop, the only way to get that bell-shaped silhouette was through petticoats. And, you know, the more petticoats, the more poopy your skirt. And so wearing a um, hoop like this, a cage crinoline, which was invented in 1856, actually saved women from wearing um, several layers, which, you know, is less fabric to drag around, less, you know, less that your legs are going to get all sweaty and stuff. So um, this was an, an improvement in women's lives. And it's also not as um, difficult to maneuver in. The hoops kind of fold up like an accordion. So, um, you know, sitting down isn't generally a, program, uh, a problem. They're kind of, they're easier to maneuver in than they look like. The con is, um, as I alluded to before, they really could be hazardous to your health. And I've included this, this is a snippet from a um, New Hampshire newspaper and they're reprinting a tidbit that came to them from the London Court Journal in 1858, gives the list of 19 females burned by their clothes taking fire so as to cause their death between January and February. Certainly an average of three deaths per week from crinolines in conflagration ought to startle the most thoughtless of the privileged sex. So basically, um, you know, if you're wearing 
skirts that extend a couple feet out from your body in an era where there's a lot of stoves and you know fireplaces and open fire and sparks flying um, sometimes the worst really did happen um, and beyond that there are things like women getting caught in machinery women um, whose hoops are getting caught um, in carriages and carriage wheels um, so you know there are there's the the off story where um, bad things did happen, but you know, generally um, women survived the hoop just like they survived the corset. These stories are kind of few and far between and tend to be um, sensationalized in the press as well. Next we're going to do the over petticoat and this helped to hide the lines of the hoop and smooth out the appearance of the skirt and every so often you'll see a 19th century um, photograph from the 1860s where someone doesn't have um, an over petticoat on and you can see their hoop um, right through their dress and it kind of like wasn't a good look you know it's sort of like a, a little bit of a faux pas like you were supposed to um, the illusion was that you had this smooth bell shaped skirt um, and you weren't supposed to see the hoops that were supporting it underneath. So the interlude, um, and this is again a shot from our exhibit, this is what it looks like so far. You've got the chemise and the corset and the drawers and the under petticoat and the hoop and the over petticoat. So this is um, a woman standing around and she's not fully dressed now. She has more layers on than most of us generally wear in an average day, but you know, she's still, um, she's about three quarters of the way there at this point. So next are um, some things that have sort of passed out of use in modern times. Um, one is a pocket, and this is something that a woman could tie on if her skirt did not have pockets. Now, when I started looking at 19th century clothing, um, when I took this job as curator, I was actually surprised at how many garments do have pockets. A lot of dresses have pockets sewn right into the seams. And there's even been the occasion where I reached my hand into a pocket and pulled out somebody's handkerchief that been there since God knows what, which is really kind of fun, I think. Um, but it's not a universal thing, you know. Um, so in the case where a dress did not have pockets, you could tie this pocket on around your waist, and that's the thing that's in the bottom left over there. And so basically the way skirts were constructed, there's sort of a slit in the front, so you could reach your hand through that slit and line up with the slit in the pocket that you're carrying underneath. So carry your handkerchief in there. Um, and then you also have undersleeves and collars. And this was a um, kind of like the chemise, almost a daily part of a woman's rotation there. Um, a fresh collar and cuffs were essential and they served a double duty. First of all, it was kind of a, um, a gentility thing. You know, you wanted to look clean and well put together and that involved having clean, um, fresh collars and cuffs. They were a little touch of pretty lace at your neck and at your wrists. But the double duty they're doing is that this also happens to be um, to the grimiest parts of your body. Um, the back of your neck gets all sweaty, your wrists can get all grimy. And so having collars and cuffs like there, they actually absorb that sweat and dirt. And they are things that could be removed from your garment. They're generally just basted in for wear. Um, and then they are snipped out for laundry day, thrown in the wash, and then you baste in another um, collar or cuffs. And one um, recent donation we had um, is a family's 19th century clothing it came to us largely intact and there was just a box full of collars. There were, you know, dozens and dozens of collars. So every woman would just have, you know, oodles of collars that they would use to freshen their wardrobe. And these changed over time, you know, the, the look of the collar, the width, um, the style changed decade to decade. But um, the fact of a collar was fairly constant in the 19th century. And so now it's time to put on the dress. And so dresses um, could be either a um, bodice or a skirt, in which case your skirt would go on first and the bodice would go over it. And bodices tended to be back closing um, until about the 1850s, you start to see some front closing bodices come in. And by the 1860s, they're generally front closing. Um, but uh, so your skirt goes on and then your bodice um, and then you are almost ready to go but not quite because you still have to accessorize. And so uh, bonnet and gloves are um, kind of part of the look. It was considered in poor taste to go outside without a bonnet and gloves. And by that I mean like the etiquette said you had to have your bonnet and gloves 
on. If you were still buttoning your gloves or tying your bonnet around your chin as you were stepping out of the house, that was a no-no because you needed to have the whole look finished and put together by the time you left. And then finally, um, jewelry added a refined touch as well. So um, brooches were very common at the throat. And what's really fun when examining the um, historic clothing is to see at the necks of dresses, um, you often, often see lots of little pinholes where it's obvious that someone has pinned a brooch again and again and again and again and left little holes in their garment. Um, the necklace we have is one of my favorites because this is a hair necklace. This was um, worn by a woman in the 1860s and it was uh, created by with hair from her mother. So this was a way that 19th century folks showed affection for each other. Um, there's no more intimate bond than uh, wearing someone else's hair. And this could be um, a signal of, you know, mourning and keeping contact with someone who is deceased. It was very common to clip the hair of the deceased and save it for jewelry, but the person didn't have to be dead. You could also take your best friend's hair or your spouse's hair or your mother's hair and wear jewelry made out of that. It was more um, signaling the relationship um, more so than like a, a grieving or bereavement. And then finally we have, um, there's a pocket watch on view there and pocket watches were um, fairly common signs of gentility um, and they were worn on a watch. And so if you look closely at a lot of 19th century photos, you'll see the watch chain and the watch itself would be tucked into the waistband or into a little um, pocket sewn onto the bottom of the bodice. So we're gonna look at this woman in the 19th century and now you can kind of see all her layers. Um, you see the finished product, how she's all put together. But when we look at her closely, you can see, okay, she's got cuffs on, she's got her collar on. You can see her watch chain and her pocket watch tucked into her waistband there. You can see the fullness of her skirt that's supported by hoops, but you can't see the hoops, which means that um, she has an over petticoat on, which is smoothing the lines of those hoops. And you can see by the nice fit of her bodice that um, it is being supported by a corset underneath. So let's stop and chat again. A um, couple of questions again for you. What do you have to be wearing to feel fully put together? And a follow-up question, how has this changed over the course of your life or from your parents' generation to yours? And I think for a lot of us, this has changed from a few months ago till now because getting dressed in pandemic when I'm working from home um, is a lot different than if I'm going to set foot um, outside the house. My mask, yeah, mask is a part of it now too. And put together means, you know, you define it as you will. If you are going outside the house and you're seeing people in a, you know, occasion that's more than going to the grocery store, what do you feel like you need to be wearing to kind of pull off the look? Earrings, that's nice. I haven't gotten to jewelry. Matching socks. I'm seeing perfume and makeup. And someone asked about chatelaines and I, um, I did not include a chatelaine and I should have because they're awesome and that would have been a great visual. I don't know if we have one in a collection, but a chatelaine is um, something that a woman would wear um, on her waist and it's basically like a lot of little chains and they're connected to things like a little pair of scissors or um, you know uh, keys and things like that. It's basically like a kind of prettier version of a giant key fob that uh, a housekeeper or a you know lady of the house would carry around to have all her tools and keys. Lip gloss. Um, lip gloss for me fell by the wayside during the pandemic. I was still wearing it under my mask for a couple months and then realized like why am I bothering this? Hey, thank you so much again for sharing. And um, let's see, we're going to keep moving along. And so now I'm gonna take you just through the um, underpinnings through the 1800s. So we've seen all the layers um, as they pertain to the 1860s to give you a sense of what the layers are. And this is to kind of take us through um, decade by decade to see how they've changed. So um, the, the general concept is the same, a chemise, a corset, but um, the different silhouettes of each era kind of require different foundational garments. So we'll walk through those. 
1810, so the first dress in our lineup, um, we say 1820, um, it's our earliest garment. It might be as early as 1815. Um, so I included the 1810s and also Jane Austen is kind of fun. Um, this is an era where, so in France, we're in the wake of the revolution. And so all the like, wide pannier supported skirts of the um, 18th century have gone by the wayside. The moniker has been overthrown. We have this very simple, you know, columnar egalitarian type fashion. Um, it hits big in the United States because the United States is a new republic. And so this idea of wearing something that harkens back to ancient Greece and Rome and looks like the cradle of democracy is really big over here too. So the look is, you know, the Jane Austen empire waist um, straight Underneath, women um, are still wearing corsets. Um, they might be shorter. Um, often, though, they're actually longer. They extend down the torso and help to give a kind of columnar shape to people. And they're wearing a chemise, maybe a petticoat. But honestly, the 1810s is about as free as women are going to be for more than another century. After that, the uh, look gets more involved, the undergarments get a little bit more constricting, the layers start to pile on. So um, women had it pretty good in the 1810s and then uh, things started to kind of pile up and the silhouette expanded. So here we have the 1820s and the 1830s. Um, we are getting into the romantic era now. So the look for the next several decades is going to be um, kind of the hourglass, kind of poofy on top, a narrow waist and then skirts that are going to get increasingly poofy and wide until they max out in the 1860s again. And so um, another note about corsets and tight lacing, it's not really necessary in the Romantic era because there's an optical illusion associated with this hourglass silhouette. You know, if you've got poofy wide shoulders and a wide floofy skirt, your waist is going to look narrow um, just by comparison, you know, without having to cinch it to 17 inches. Here we also have, um, you're seeing the effects of um, industrialization in the textile industry. You are seeing um, the boom of the slave economy in the United States, um, the mass production of cotton, um, the um, stolen labor of millions of African Americans in, um, on American plantations, the uh, labor of factory workers in England and increasingly in the United States that is cranking out mass produced um, quantities of fabric that makes fashion like this affordable to people. Um, this type of fashion with all these yards and yards of fabric just doesn't work if fabric is super expensive or not um, readily accessible. And so the, the key uh, support thing, which is kind of fun here, are these um, arm plumpers. And if we go back, you can see she's got them tied around her arms. And that's to uh, puff up her sleeves. And these could be filled with cotton. They could be filled with down. But they were tied around the arms to kind of accentuate that um, poofy arm look. Going into the 1840s, 1850s, um, Especially in the 1840s, um, the look was this very um, long-waisted, um, very narrow kind of tall conical shaped waist. And so your corsets tend to be um, very long um, and the movement was sort of restricted in the arms. The arms were tighter in the 1840s. I'm not sure how great an example that is at the corset. We do start to have um, front closing corsets, but a lot of them are still closing in the back at that point. Um, the front closing ones, when they come in, are um, sort of a revolution because they make it much easier for a woman to um, hook up her corset by herself. So if it was a front a split busk, it's known front closing corset, um, the laces would be in the back. You would um, put it on, um, kind of wrap it around your waist and then hook it up in front and then you reach behind you and you can kind of fiddle with the laces to adjust the fit on it. And so the key pieces of undergarments here that make this possible are um, the petticoats. And this is pre-cage crinoline until 1856. So remember, you need a bell-shaped skirt, and the best way to get that is through these petticoats. And so what we're looking at here are a um, true crinoline, which is the French word for horsehair. This is a skirt that's literally woven with horsehair that makes it very um, stiff. And on the right is a corded petticoat. So it's petticoat with cords sewn into it. And so these are little tricks that um, will help to um, increase the, the 
diameter of your skirt um, without, you know, just piling petticoat on top of petticoat, although they were probably still doing that as well. Skip the 1860s because um, we went through that in great detail earlier. So now we're in the 1870s and 1880s. And this is when you get kind of the most dramatic evolution of fashion. You go from the hoop skirt of the 1860s and then by the mid 1870s, it's all about the bustle. So it's like you take the volume of the skirts and just put it in the back. Um, this is an era where the sewing machine has made its way into most middle class homes. So you see a lot of um, like embellishment on clothing, you know, because you're saving so much time sewing with your sewing machine. Now you have time to add ruffles and bows and lace and this and that. Um, so they tend to be very elaborate clothes. Um, and the main thing is how you're supporting that bustle behind. So here's an example here. We've got the chemise, the corset, and she's wearing a bustle cage, um, sometimes known as a lobster tail. And so basically this is like a hoop skirt, except for it's all in the back. Um, it does fold up like an accordion. So, um, you know, she can sit down fairly easily, although she is sitting on a huge wad of fabric behind her. And so the things that kind of define this area era are the variety of bustle supports available. Um, it kind of, and the 1870s and 1880s, um, as we get closer to the end of the century, the fashion and the looks are changing faster and faster. And again, this is a um, reflection of the increasing industrialization. Um, there's mass production of these things. There's fashion magazines being put out. Um, there's, you know, there's a whole lot of factors coming together to make fashion change faster and faster. And so one of those things is, you know, a whole bunch of patents coming out and products being developed basically for the sole purpose of um, making a woman's rear end stick out behind her. So here are some of the examples there. When we get to the 1890s, um, this is sort of, it's almost like a throwback to the 1820s and 1830s. We're back to those super poofy arms um, from the mid 1890s um, and an A-line skirt now. Um, so again, we've got um, corsets, we've got fluffy petticoats. This is when you start to see um, a lot of interesting things happen in underwear. This is when um, we finally got some color becoming standardized in women's undergarments. So you see um, these beautiful colored corsets that look like they could be sold in Victoria's Secret today. They're so elaborate and colorful. Um, we have the brief return of the arm extenders. Um, the chemise and um, drawers get combined into something called a combination, um, which is, you know, kind of just what it sounds like. It's sort of like a one piece um, undergarment thing. Um, again, you start to see different colors in petticoats and undergarments like here. So the variety really picks up. Um, and you do see this is when we've got um, the mass production of women's garments coming in. Uh, mass production of men's garments started much, much earlier in the um, second quarter of the 19th century. It wasn't until after the Civil War that um, women's garments start to be mass produced. But by the 1890s, um, you know, you can order your um, bum pad that makes your skirt extend just ever so much and your corset and your combination from your Sears catalog and have it delivered to your door. And we'll wind up with the 1890s, 1900s. Um, the 1900s see um, this really unique silhouette, um, which was called the S-curve or the um, mono bosom or the powder pigeon bosom. And basically um, it's meant to, it's like having a poofy sort of bust um, up front and then um, your bottom kind of sticking out in the back. And so the key to this is, you know, a certain type of corset that reinforces that. And there's an advertisement from that area, the old style corset. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not wrong. Um, in the 1880s, um, 1870s, the corsets did kind of like push out in front and allowed for sort of a rounded belly, like lower in the waist. But the new figure was meant to be, you picture an S. So like the top curve of the S is the bust sort of swinging around to the waist and then the back part protruding is the rear end. Um, so having gone through all that, I wanna check the time. Um, we are down to, we're 11 minutes out. Um, I wanna ask what innovation in clothing underwear um, you are most grateful for?
stretchy fabric. Yep. Bronze set of corset. Yep, I hear you. Okay, and I do think we've finished in decent enough time um, that I'm going to ask Elizabeth to play a short little six minute video for you. And this um, will take us behind the scenes. There's always stuff that doesn't make it into the exhibition. So we like to go into our collection center and open up boxes and show you some of our treasures that um, didn't get into the show. So Elizabeth, if you don't mind um, playing the, the behind the scenes video um, that Lorna shot the other day. Hi everybody, welcome to the Research and Collection Center. Right now we're going to go behind the scenes and look at some examples of underpinnings and skirt supports that did not make it into the exhibition. It's always fun to take a look and see what we have here in our costume storage area. So we're just going to dive in, start going through this box. This is a bum pad um, from about the 1890s and it is filled with something as I'm pinching it. Um, it feels like maybe horse hair um, in it and this is something that just gives a little bit of oomph to the back side. Um, if you'll recall the looks of the 1890s and 1900s has just a little bit of a bump out and back so this is something that ties around the waist and gives something without being too much. Um, and of course I should have mentioned that I did wash my hands before beginning this. Um, that is best practices when dealing with antique textiles to have clean hands. And let's see what else we have here. We have another little bum pad. Um, this one's fun. It's got this like poofy little, um, again filled with horse hair um, thing that will accentuate the bum and in back it's got these coiled springs sewn in here. So again this is something that would tie around the waist. It gives a little bit of definition in the back without being um, overly much. Also in black, so this tells me it's probably 1890s-ish, the very end of the 19th century is when you start to see um, undergarments show up in colors other than just pure white. Digging a little further, now we get to the more interesting one, and this one I would probably put in the 1880s, um, just because this is a little bit more elaborate and gives a little bit more definition to the back end. And so we have this um, system of wires with this giant coiled spring held together by tape, and again would tie around the waist. So beginning in the 1880s, you just see um, all kinds of patents flooding the market and all kinds of products. So there's um, many, many different ways that women could have um, accentuated their back end and supported their bustle. So this is one of them. And this is another one, um, again, fairly elaborate. We've got this um, kind of tape covered metal um, in this folding accordion type cage here. Um, cross hatching stays or ties here that could be kind of pulled tight to adjust. Um, the tighter you pull it in front, the more this is gonna kind of poof out in the back here. Um, this one is nice because it's stamped with the maker. This is the Canfield Bustle, uh, which dates to 1887, made by the Canfield Rubber Company in New York. Probably can't see that, um, but, and you can see with the, and it's even got these little springs here. Um, so this uh, complex piece of engineering, and the idea being if you sat down, these would kind of like fold up like an accordion to make it easier to sit down. Going a little bit deeper, um, we find this kind of wire cage. This is probably, um, could be either 1880s or 1890s, might be 1890s just because it's kind of a, a smaller version of it. Again, it's just giving a little bit of support in the back, um, this wire mesh cage that would tie around the waist with an adjustable tape here. You could kind of cinch it to anywhere you wanted it to be. A 
This is one of my favorites. Um, again, we've got a little horsehair pad here to give a little um, bum padding. And then these are three coiled springs that are encased in muslin. So this is, again, something that would sit, um, picture this kind of on someone's rear end like that sticking out to, um, this would have supported a bustle look, probably dates to the um, 1880s. What's nice here is that we've got the um, original tape and then this kind of homemade extender has been sewn onto it. So um, someone might have been um, accommodating a weight gain, a pregnancy, um, kind of a change in physique where they needed to extend the waist tape at home. And I think this might be our very last one, and this is the most elaborate. So this is a full-on bustle cage. So um, this is the back end over here. It would have, um, we're missing the ties, but uh, it would have been able to lace up tight here. And this actually goes behind the bottom. This part wraps around the waist. Um, so you've got support for the skirt here. And then the back part over here is what extends the skirt uh, behind. So again, this is probably um, 1880s, if it's not marked with a date. And again, this very um, elaborate contraption of these little fabric covered wires, the tape, it's got that kind of accordion um, system built into it that allows for um, a surprising ease of motion given how complicated it is. So thank you for taking a peek with me in the collections. We're going to uh, go back to um, our live discussion and hopefully we'll be able to dive into some um, thoughts or comments or questions. So thanks. Um, so I wanted to give you my email address in case anyone has any um, questions that doesn't get answered tonight or you want to reach out to me personally. Um, and I also want to end by um, encouraging people to uh, make a donation if you enjoyed the program or to visit the shop. Um, this uh, sells our lookbook for the Fashioning Illinois exhibition, also Fashioning Illinois um, themed mask here. Um, we've got a lot of great stuff and it is the holiday season. So if you have shopping to do, um, I encourage you to visit shop.illinoisstatemuseum.org and know that the proceeds do go to um, benefiting the state museum. So you can get cool things and um, do a good deed. And now uh, I'd love to open it up to questions. Um, Elizabeth, if you don't mind tossing me a couple and we are coming right up on eight. So if anyone wants to duck out, um, thank you for joining. If you to stick around and um, uh, listen to the questions being answered, um, you are welcome to as well. All right, so um, we, let's see, scrolling through so many great questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone asked that they, they said that they've seen patterns for knitted um, under petticoats. Was that done often um, or is quilted or flannel more, um, more often used? In our museum's collection, I have only seen um, flannel um, for warmth and quilted. I have not, seen, we don't have a knitted example. Um, that doesn't mean they didn't exist. Um, my sense is they were somewhat less common, but I don't think they were non-existent. Okay. Um, someone asked if you didn't necessarily have another um, woman in the house to help you get dressed in all of these layers, what would, what would you do? Um, that's a great question. And so um, there is a series of YouTube videos and the woman who hosts them, um, the, it's prior attire. So prior is in before, P-R-I-O-R attire. And she has put together the series of videos that goes through like medieval times to the 1920s and she will film herself putting on all the undergarments um, and so she actually has one that sort of deconstructs the myth that um, people cannot dress themselves and um, I actually and Elizabeth if you don't mind dropping the link in the chat for the dressing video that we did um, I actually start in one that's in the exhibit right now. Um, I didn't feel right asking a colleague if I could film them putting on old underwear, so um, I did it myself. Um, but the short answer to the question is, especially after the corset um, has the 
slit in front, then it becomes pretty easy to put it on yourself. Um, before that, I would imagine um, if it's not split in front, you would sort of have to like put it on over your head and reach behind to tie it. Um, so, you know, it takes some doing and it does take, you know, several minutes to assemble all the layers, but also keep in mind that these women are doing this on a daily basis and it's what they're used to and, you know, so they've, they've got it down, they, they know how to get dressed. So it's certainly easier with an extra pair of hands, you know, if you've got a domestic servant or a husband handy, it makes things go easier, but it's not um, impossible to get dressed by yourself. Um, so how long would a person expect to wear a bustle and some of these contraptions? Um, were these just like special occasion dresses or was this daily you're wearing these crazy things? Well, what we think are crazy. <laughs> it was, it was an everyday thing and there are layers and occasions to getting dressed that one can um, sort of glean about the 19th century through etiquette manuals and you know personal reminiscences diaries um there's probably the pattern the nuance of it is sort of lost to modern viewers but in general um you dressed if you were going to see people so if you were going out um to you know, pay a social call, if you were having company over, if you were going to a party, then you would get dressed in your like outfit and that would have a bustle. If you are staying home, um, you know, to clean the house or you're not expecting company, you're just gonna write letters or whatever. Um, they had garments called wrappers. Now some of the wrappers actually, we've got one on display in the museum. Um, it's constructed, so it's meant to go over a bustle cage, which um, I don't see the relaxation and, you know, lounging around the home in your full underpinnings, but um, so there are varying degrees. And then of course, there are questions of um, uh, sort of geographic location, you know, a rural woman who's working on a farm um, is not going to put on a bustle to do her farm work. Um, a, you know, a woman who is a domestic servant isn't going to be wearing um, a bustle when she's about her business, although she might when she goes to church on Sunday. So it's kind of dependent on a woman's um, means, her social status, her personal inclination, um, where she is, what she's doing that day, a whole lot of factors. But in general, um, being dressed means you're gonna like see someone on a social basis and that would require a bustle. Great. Well, we are right at eight o'clock. So unfortunately, I think that's all we're going to have time for. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.